Thank you, Michael. Um, Evidencity, uh, just in a nutshell, Evidencity is uh, we exist to combat modern slavery. We do, through, uh, we do so through financial inclusion, global supply chain transparency, and investigative due diligence. Um, happy to speak more with anybody that uh, after the event that would like to learn more about that. Uh, we do so in a hybrid model where we use both a data solution as well as on the ground research capabilities. So happy to talk to anybody, uh, anybody about that later. I, I will tell you that we uh, coordinated and actually um, are releasing a new product today. And uh, uh, thrilled to announce that today we are launching a new modern slavery product. We believe that it's the first product on the market that allows for human trafficking research on a global basis through an on-demand pay-as-you-go platform. Um, and so again, if anybody's interested in, in that or anything in Evidencity, please uh, find me afterwards. Um, before I introduce my friend Neil, um, I just want to say something that's uh, kind of on my heart, and that is that I want to thank you all for being here, whether you're here in person or if you're on online. And I know that as a sponsor of an event, I'm supposed to say something like that, but this is actually a little bit uh, deeper. Uh, and that is that um, maybe, maybe it's your job to be here, maybe um, you were invited to be here, maybe you're just kind of curious. But what I want to say is, is that I, th I thank you um, in a heartfelt manner for being here and caring about this issue. What is happening, um, I believe, is the industrialization of evil. Um, that's what we're here talking about today. It's the industrialization of evil. And I don't know what your favorite sport is. My favorite sport is football. Neil's favorite sport is football, but we were comparing notes, and I think he's talking about a different game, so we'll take care of that over a pint or two later. Uh, but whatever your favorite sport is, um, if this was a game, the refs would have called it. That's how badly we're losing. And so I thank you for being here, wherever you're coming from, the nonprofit world, the academic world, um, uh, the legislative world, lobbying, for-profit, non-profit, wherever you're coming from, thank you for being here because only together can we actually start turning the tide and do, doing something about this evil. So uh, thank you all. Uh, Neil, if you'll join me on the stage. Um, 36 years of law enforcement experience in the United Kingdom. He is the chief executive officer of the Traffic Analysis Hub, an initiative developed by Stop the Traffic in partnership with IBM and Clifford Chance. The platform uses IBM technology while working with law enforcement and financial institutions to disrupt human trafficking routes and their associated money laundering schemes. Welcome, Neil. Thank you, David. I'm hoping I'm switched on. I, I believe I am as well. So, Neil, uh, Stop the Traffic is a nonprofit based in London. Uh, it's been um, working on this issue for almost 20 years. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the organization and some of the good work that you're doing? Surely. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you this morning. Um, I echo the comments of the previous speakers about the value of this kind of forum and the kind of investment that uh, is, is being placed from commerce uh, into finding ways to remediate this issue. Um, Stop the traffic were created about 20 years ago um, as a short-term response to um, uh, the transatlantic slavery anniversary, the legislation to, uh, to, to make that outlawed. Um, uh, and here we are almost 20 years later still struggling to find the right solution. We're about prevention of human trafficking. Um, most not-for-profits look at rescue rehabilitation, valuable work, uh, but, but we're about how to, how to prevent it. Um, and I was deputy director of our national agency, um, a very small version of the FBI, I suppose, um, in, in the UK when I bumped in to stop the traffic um, and listened to them in 2007 describe a crime issue that was not a priority for my, for my organization. Um, uh, and since, um, since I joined that journey, um, I discovered just what an enormous crime issue we were ignoring. Um, and I've also learned, um, to my um, disappointment, that law enforcement alone cannot be the solution to this crime. It, it needs um, the widest possible partnership to make change. Um, in 2010, um, I took some time out and went with the NGO to India um, for some time. 
um, and found myself during that visit in a room with about 20 survivors of trafficking um, who were in a reintegration process, learning new skills so that they could sustain themselves going forward, all women. Um, and listening to their stories, um, where they were first approached to go on a journey that took them into trafficking and exploitation, what that journey looked like, uh, where they were exploited, how they were exploited, and all of that data was on the cutting room floor. No, none of it was being um, leveraged in any way, shape, or form that could help NGOs, law enforcement, businesses understand how, when, where the risk was occurring. And that struck me as an anomaly. Um, how could we take those stories, that lived experience, in a way that was safe, didn't jeopardize the individual sharing it, how, how could we take that material and turn it into consumable insights for every actor around the world that could utilize that effectively to make their supply chain stronger, um, to build resilience in their activity and actually begin to address the fundamentals of the trafficking market economy. And, and it is um, an errant economy that lives below our radar. Um, and so began the journey towards Traffic Analysis Hub. How could we collect industrial quantities of lived experience in a way that was curated, classified, accessible, consumable to every actor in every sector? IBM, bless them, um, came on board in 2017 and spent about $5 million developing beneficially, didn't charge us for any of that, uh, to build Traffic Analysis Hub, um, which now has about 220 partners using it around the globe. Most of those are NGOs, some of them are businesses. <coughs> Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, uh, and we, we accept that this is a marathon and not a sprint. Um, but we are making progress and we are able to better describe um, trafficking and exploitation, how it works and where it works, uh, particularly how it might overlap your business. Thank you, Neil. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about palm oil. Uh, palm oil is a $65 billion um, uh, global supply chain business. Um, it can be found in roughly about half of the products. If you go to the supermarket, you will find palm oil, oil somewhere within the ingredients and most cosmetic brands. 85% um, of that supply chain comes from either Indonesia or Malaysia. And you worked an interesting case over the last couple of years, um, and I'm uh, from Malaysia, and I'm wondering if you can talk about that and what you learned. So this is, a, a, I think, a really interesting example, um, uh, and and it involves a great deal of the um, the concepts that we've talked about today, already. N not me personally. Um, uh, I'm a great fan of legislation like the withhold release order. Um, capability of US Customs and Border Protection. Um, uh, and this case um, with the corporate Syme Darby Corporation in Malaysia came to light in late 2020, um, where a, um, a huge palm oil producing corporate, um, a supplier to most of the consumer packaged goods companies that we all know uh, as big brands, um, both here in the US and around the world, uh, were discovered to have large labor exploitation problems in their plantations and mills in Malaysia. Um, some of the interesting facts that were turned up by the investigators from journalism and NGOs that began to uncover this problem um, were that in, in recent years, the workforce in Syme Darby uh, had almost been completely replaced with people from the Rohingya refugee communities who'd exited Myanmar in 2017 and had been housed in uh, Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh for some time and been recruited from there. Families taking a long journey to these plantations and being employed there and, and then their terms of employment being changed to make uh, quotas, etc., impossible to deliver without the whole family being out working for the entirety of their time. No schooling, uh, little opportunity for family life, a complete uh, abrogation of everything that they've been promised. Um, the fact that this, the, these stories came to light is a testament, I think, to the network of NGOs making um, 
making clear how this risk manifests itself in in businesses uh, around the world. And we've talked about many of the areas today in, uh, in previous conversations. Um, the fact that US CBP issued that withhold release order in December 2020 was a significant blow to those CPG businesses that need that palm oil in their factories. Um, and having those containers sit on a dockside uh, with the trade finance that's associated with that with um, th the gap in production that that, uh, that ensued from that, uh, that's a problem of, of considerable proportions. Even bigger than that was the, uh, the massive remediation process that they needed to fund um, to make the appropriate changes and, and, and get that business moving again, which was essential for them. Um, so uh, we're now in a situation where those withhold release orders have been have been changed on the basis of that remediation. It's a wonderful example, I think, to, uh, to the world of business. Um, you know, when a, when a workforce changes in quite the way it did at Syme Derby, what questions do you need to ask to understand why that happened and how it happened? I think it, it, it brings to light also the massive vulnerability of large groups of people on the move um, uh, and in difficult circumstances like the Rohingya, like following earthquake and other disasters. Uh, the vulnerability scale um, goes up significantly. Um, uh, and, and there are things that we need to look for, both as businesses, as law enforcement, as NGOs, uh, as, as, as people with an interest in our world. Um, so Traffic Analysis Hub and, um, and the work that we do to try and um, articulate um, for every consumer what trafficking and exploitation it, it looks like um, uh, and, and how, it, um, how it arises, uh, we, we think makes a contribution to changing the market dynamic for traffickers. Um, they need to have a demand for uh, the goods and services of people they have in, in, in exploitation uh, and they need to maintain that demand and they need to recruit people and they use Indeed, and LinkedIn and other systems to do that recruiting, just as if they were legitimate businesses. Um, and, and everybody in that supply chain of people needs to understand um, how they can spot the problems and ask better questions. And hopefully, uh, that, that, that's what we did. I think it was a brilliant example. In, we, we talked about how, in, uh, from a corporate compliance perspective, when you get a red flag, you do your investigation, you eliminate somebody from your supply chain. As, as a corporation, you've done your job. Um, and yet, that can have ripple effects down that supply chain to the actual individuals that were involved in that trafficking or forced labor. Do you want to talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, for sure. I, I think when you begin to follow that investigation, the potential is that you'll find a corrupt actor, a bad actor in there somewhere or more than one. Um, so, so it isn't um, necessarily just about um, we need to reduce our labour costs, we need to outsource our, our labour um, to contractors. There, we have often found that there is a bad actor who has been bribed effectively um, a, along the way, somewhere in, in a key place. Um, uh, and uh, I can't say that that, um, that arose in the Syme Derby uh, equation that I've just described, but we find that very often I in, in cases like this. Um, particular cases in the UK in recent times, um, always a bad actor has been inserted into the, uh, into the equation or someone has been compromised within, uh, within the corporate concerned. Um, so. So, so that's an issue too. There's an old adage, uh, follow the money. Um, follow the money and you'll get to the truth. Follow the money, you'll find a crime. Um, I would like to end kind of on a more hopeful note uh, and like to talk about the, the initiative that's happening right now in Ireland um, around follow the money around trying to prevent this activity because again, ultimately, this is a business. It's an Ill illegitimate business, it's an illegal bu business, business, it is an evil business, and yet 
at its core, it's a business, and therefore it wants to make money. Uh, so you can talk a little bit about the public-private coordination and initiative out of Ireland and, and what effect that's having? Please do. Um, so for some years, Stop the Traffic have had a strong relationship uh, with the Bank and Payments Federation of Ireland, um, running training programs for Irish financial institutions uh, and sensitizing them to um, how trafficking and exploitation um, creates money flows and how those money flows interact with financial systems, um, everything from um, money service bureaus all the way through to investment banking. Um, and that has um, begun to turn into uh, um, the first um, human trafficking focused sharing um, uh, conversation between all the financial institutions in Ireland, including the regulator, including um, the FIU, the law enforcement FIU that receives suspicious activity reports from institutions and, uh, and businesses. Um, and, and there's a conversation about um, what they see in their individual environments. So a sharing of intelligence um, in a way that I think is really, um, really important going forward. Um, uh, and businesses, business groupings, so I've heard the Responsible Business Alliance mentioned this morning. Uh, I, I'm, I also talked to um, AIM Progress, who are another interesting business alliance. Um, I think the concept of um, sharing what, what we know um, about instances of trafficking and exploitation in money flows and supply chains, I think this is a really important step forward that will ultimately reduce the market for trafficking and exploitation, which is what we're all about. Do you, do you have any anecdotes or, or anything where that's been successful that you can share? Yes, I do. Um, there's a... Um, uh, Good. <laughs> There's a, a, a business grouping in the UK that is now called the Modern Slavery Intelligence Network. Um, it, it, it's a group of retailers in the food sector. The food sector is hugely vulnerable to trafficking and exploitation. Um, everything from big agriculture, so picking and packing of fruit and vegetables through to processing um, uh, plants, meat processing plants, etc. Um, there was a case in the, in the UK where, over a period of five years, uh, a particular Polish organised crime group um, trafficked in and exploited in excess of 500 people to the UK into those sectors. Um, and that affected all of our big retailers um, and food producers. So they ended up getting together and over the last three years um, have gone through so many legal hoops to get... Um, to get to be able to share anything amongst them, but they are actually now, they're compliance teams, they're audit teams, where they see something that's an anomaly, they're sharing it with the remainder of the group in ways that help the entire grouping of businesses just ask smarter questions, um, just be forewarned and forearmed. Um, and, and I think that's massively reduced their vulnerability and I'm hoping it continues. Yeah, I think, I think uh, the takeaway point is coordination, collaboration, communication, um, by working together across all these different sectors, we can, we can actually make a difference. So thank you, Neil, thank you to the Chamber, and thank you, uh, everyone, for your attendance. Thank you.